We're here today to ask people about marriage. For starters, what's the best thing about being married? Who I get to stay married to. <laughs> Family. Togetherness. To me, is having a companion. This person. My favorite thing about being married is that I have a partner. Do you think your marriage is good for more than just the two of you? Uh, Can we just influence those around us? Yeah, I think. In a positive way? I think so. I would hope that people would see that uh, when we're together that we really have a very true affection for each other. What everybody wants and it, we, we know we're lucky to have it. The energy we give out in our home, I think, spreads out to other people. Your marriage just continues to go on and on and on. Oh, sure, and yep. affect generations after us. I think it really sort of stabilizes your whole community. It's a cornerstone of a society, right? Sounds like a good marriage goes a long way. It touches a lot of people. Want to improve your marriage? For ideas, go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Reflected here uh, among us today is a variety of specialties which represent the diverse world 
which is the world of law and of laws, from specialties as ancient as canon law to our colleagues who specialize in the cutting edge realm of internet law. And indeed, you are all truly welcome today. When I began my study of canon law, I was introduced to that famous maxim which is attributed to Aristotle, who lived 300 years before Christ. Ubi homo ibi societas, ubi societas ibi ius. Very simply translated, where there is man, there is a society. And where there is a society, there is law. For the ancient Greeks and Romans, the word for law and the idea of law was synonymous with the word and the concept for justice. And perhaps one of the great tragedies for those of us whose days are frantically filled with the practice of law is how little time we spend or have to spend considering the nature of law and the vocation of the profession of law. And it's for this reason that days like today are, are so very important to us to remember who we are and exactly why our Creator has placed us here. That other great philosopher, Plato, quoting Socrates, reminds us that the unexamined life is not worth living. Unless each of us is reflectively engaged in one of the most human of activities, the practice of law, then we are no longer lawyers, attorneys, counselors, judges, paralegals, clerks of court, and other ministers of the law but we become merely technicians of the law. When we practice law, divorce from its true meaning, its intrinsic value, then there is that temptation of the Pharisees to use law self selfishly for lower ends and separated from its intrinsic value to individuals and to our society. When we practice law merely as technicians of the law, we remove law, we divorce it from its true meaning, its humanity, it's higher calling, no matter what arena is our specialty of law. So much of our lives as lawyers, as attorneys, deals with the written word. Today, more and more on the computer screen rather on pieces of paper, which I much prefer. Nonetheless, the temptation is to see only the ink or the pixels and to forget that before us represents lives, represents people in their interrelationship with society. The ancient Roman jurist, Demetrius Ulpianus, held an exalted idea of the lawyer's calling. Lawyers, to his mind, 
were understood to be priest of the law, priest of justice. Similarly, St. Thomas More, the patron saint of lawyers, embodied a career which maintained no division between morality, the ethical character of the person with the practice of law as a vocation and as a true service to the good of mankind. I encourage you to become part of a new endeavor in our diocese about which you will hear more at the end of Mass, namely the, the founding of the St. Thomas More Society of Acadiana. I think this will fit and fill a, a need that we certainly have. Priest of justice. In a sense, then, the lawyer's desk is like his or her altar, where higher values are promoted and venerated. It's no small significance if we reflect on it that many of our courtrooms look like churches. I think they're built in that way out of a sense of what they are. Catholic theology, Christian theology, insists on the spiritual significance of our work and maintains that it's a false dichotomy to view our work as divorced from our faith. Is it unprofessional for an attorney to say, I am engaged in God's work? I am engaged in God's work. Certainly there's the necessity of living a balanced life. Law is demanding. Shake your heads if you agree. Incredibly demanding. It can be all-consuming. Unfortunately, there are far too many widows and widowers and orphans of the law. When a lawyer's profession becomes absolutely everything, we all need time for our families, for recreation, for balance, and most importantly, for God. However, it is also unhealthy to so compartmentalize our lives to the extent that there is no unifying theme, that we are different people in different contexts. When who I am on Sunday is so drastically different than who I am in the courtroom or in the conference room. What could possibly unite the many elements of a lawyer's life? Dare I speak today about the importance of the lawyer's daily prayer life? daily prayer life when heart speaks to heart and mind speaks to mind of the divine. Law must be practiced on our knees. If there is to be a reform of law in our nation, and who can doubt the urgency of that need? 
then does not that reform begin in the mind and the heart of each attorney? I love the quote from William Scott Downey, law without justice is a wound without a cure. And how often we see that. Where do we find that cure? St. Teresa of Avila, in the 16th century counter-reformation, ushered in a spiritual revolution throughout Spain. She was called upon by God to reform the Carmelite nuns of Spain, who had, in all obviousness, lost their way. And she reformed the lives of her fellow religious, so many of whom, despite their calling, had become more interested in the world than in serving God. How did she do it? What was the secret to her spiritual revolution? She introduced the nuns and through her fellow religionist, St. John of the Cross, to a very simple way of meditating every day on the Word of God. In the computer world, we speak of trash in, trash out, and that's us. I cannot become a more godly priest, a more godly lawyer, a more godly minister of the law, unless I regularly fill my mind and my heart with the word of God. Our lives need that unifying element, that deepest part that can never be taken away from us if we're to be truly human and fulfill our purpose on the earth. Psalm 19, I believe, is the psalm of the godly lawyer. Lord, how I love your law, how I meditate upon it day and night. Verse 1997. Like Jesus in the Gospels, we must withdraw from the daily frenzied world and develop the habit of daily meditation on the Word of God. We study the law, but how about our study of the law of God? And in this way, opening ourselves to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then, and then, the result is that you and I carry with us into the office, into the conference room, into the courtroom, the voice of the Holy Spirit. We carry justice with us, because if justice is not in us, then justice will not be accomplished. As I studied law in a, in my case, canon law, in a different language and in an international context, I often wondered what my life as a lawyer would look like, as a priest lawyer. I wonder what the big questions would be. I wondered whether or not I would be bored out of my skull. I doubted the latter, however, because even among my canon law friends, I was considered to be a hopeless legal geek with the unfortunate capacity to become absorbed in the minutia of this giant ocean that we call the law. I anticipated that my future as a canonist would be tribunal work, 
immersed in marriage law, if, if you pardon the analogy of doing autopsies on marriages. And by the way, that word annulment, if you could take it out of your vocabulary, would be great, at least in the church arena, because it's a misnomer. Because even a pope, as made clear in Matthew 19, cannot annul a true marriage. What God has joined together, men may not divide. Rather, properly, tribunals are involved in answering the question of whether or not a marriage was valid, existed on the day of contract, the day of covenant. Rather than annulment, tribunals make declarations regarding juridic facts. Was there a marriage on the day of the wedding ceremony? And even in its new and speedier process, refined by Pope Francis, that declaration never becomes res judicata. I wrote my lic licentiate thesis in the area of penal law, canonical criminal law, believing that delving into a completely different area of the law would add some balance to my legal knowledge. Little did I know that the majority of my canon law work would be in the realm of administrative law. And sadly, in recent months and years in the area of canonical penal law, this was not in the brochure. And it has not been without personal anguish to vigorously apply penal remedies in what I and others, including our good bishop, have accepted to be the timely mission of purifying the church. There is no place in the priesthood and religious life for those who would harm the young. Saint John Paul the Great famously said. We're hopelessly foolish, too, in whatever type of law we practice, if we're not vigilant to the fact that there is an enemy to justice. I'll say that again, there is an enemy to justice. The father of lies, the prince of this world, who tempts far too many of our colleagues into selling out their ethics in the belief that justice is of no account, that the law is not about justice, so long as I provide the client, the friend of the friend, with his desired result, and I sacrifice my character on the altar of human respect. In the older parlance, in canonization cases, we spoke of, and there was appointed, the devil's advocate. And his role was to argue against the sanctity of that person. Well, the devil's advocate takes out his, takes his worn out seat at the bar in so many legal proceedings. Have you noticed how easy it is for people to lie? Have you noticed how easy it is for people to lie even after taking an oath? We've forgotten the meaning of the oath. 
Canon 1199 paragraph one gives us the perennial definition of an oath. An oath is the invocation of the divine name in witness to the truth. Consider that. As attorneys, we must not forget that we too must be unwavering witnesses to the truth. I, like many of you here involved in the practice of criminal law, albeit I practice it in a very different context, can identify with the words of the late Justice Anton Scalia, who said, the judge who always likes the results he reaches is a bad judge. That word judge could be replaced with defense attorney, prosecutor, paralegal, canonist, bishop. The law, like the lawyer, must be constantly reforming itself. And that can only happen if lawyers are attentive to daily working on our moral cores, if indeed we dare hope to be priests of justice. Justice founded on truth, facts, genuine evidence, and just principles will lead us to embrace convictions which sometimes carry with them emotional pain perhaps even the loss of cherished friendships, not to mention financial disadvantage. This is the sacrificial character of law. And it brings us back to that question, am I doing God's work as a lawyer, a minister of law, am I doing God's work? As this judicial year commences, I hope that that persistent question nags each one of us, am I doing God's work? Helping us to strive for something higher, something noble, something worthy, of our sacred calling. Be not afraid. James chapter 1 verse 5 gives us a promise of which we must humbly and often avail ourselves. James writes, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.